Welcome to Under the Microscope, where we take a deep dive into agricultural research that affects everyone from farm to table. Today, we're here with Dr. James Luby, professor in the Department of Horticulture Science at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Luby has directed research here in fruit crops breeding and genetics since 1982. His program focuses on developing new varieties that combine a satisfying eating experience with cold hardiness and disease resistance. Dr. Luby was awarded as the 2023 B.Y. Morrison Memorial Lecturer. This honor recognizes scientists who have made outstanding contributions to ornamental horticulture and other environmental sciences. Welcome, Dr. Luby, to Under the Microscope. Thank you. Pleasure to be with you. My first question for you is a bit of a background. So when did apple breeding begin? Uh, well, we're probably not exactly sure, but some of the first recorded apple breeding is back around 1800 uh, in writings from a, a person named Thomas Andrew Knight in England. And he actually talked about doing intentional breeding of apples. It may have happened before that, uh, but that's kind of the first record. Here at the University of Minnesota, it began in 1878, uh, and a few fits and starts in the beginning, but we've been going continuously then since 1908 here um, in the very research center that I'm sitting at right now. And so what, what are the primary goals of apple breeding? What do researchers try and accomplish? Well, I think uh, we are mainly interested in, uh, you know, finding traits that really satisfy our stakeholders. And of course, our most important stakeholders are consumers. Um, and so what they're really looking for is a desirable eating, ex or a, a memorable eating experience, let's say. Um, so we wanna, we wanna provide that. And then ideally for producers and, and marketers and people along the supply chain, we wanna provide uh, some traits that give economic and environmental sustainability. Um, so it's, uh, you know, reduction of loss of product along the way. It's reducing pesticide sprays, those kinds of things. Uh, so we, we need to try to have some things that, that affect, hopefully positively affect all of our stakeholders. But really the most important one is, an apple's got to eat well. Um, otherwise people don't come back and buy it again. <laughs> Okay. And then, you know, I know that, it, you know, over the past 10, 20 years, there's, there's really been a boom in technology advancements. What advancements in science have you seen in apple breeding over the past 20 years, 10, 20 years, that's really kind of helped further along the apple breeding process? Yeah, I'd say the biggest advancement in the last 10 to 20 years has certainly been the incorporation of, of DNA markers into breeding. Uh, we got our first genome sequence for Apple back about 2010. And since then, we've been able to, to use that and use some of the technologies that have been developed in humans and, and for other crops to really have efficient, relatively inexpensive DNA markers to use. And so that's been, you know, the, the really fun thing here in the last part of my career. Um, so I, it, that's been an amazing advancement for us in a crop like Apple's. So when you talk about DNA markers, can, can you kind of elaborate a little bit and hopefully in, uh, in plain language what that means? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, these would be um, having bits of DNA that are associated with a trait and much like we have in humans, you know, we as humans can go in and get tested uh, for whether we might be carriers for a certain disease or something like that. And um, that's done by getting our DNA in the, in, from our blood, usually, or our saliva. And in the case of plants, we get it from green leaf tissue. We extract the DNA. And then we've got certain uh, bits of DNA in the genome that we have through previous studies associated with important traits. And they might be traits like um, crispiness, uh, ability to store well, disease resistance. It's very much like what we have for human genetic tests, uh, uh, where you might send in your saliva to, uh, you know, uh, one of the one of the commercial testing services or or a medical testing service. 
Dr. Libby, tell me, let's talk about the biggest challenges. What are the biggest challenges today to apple breeding? Uh, probably the biggest challenge is the one that has been for probably centuries, um, is that the, it's the length of time of the breeding cycle. Um, and that's just because we're working with a, a plant that is a you know, woody perennial tree. It has a long juvenile phase that it has to get through during which it's, it's not capable of flowering and reproduction. Um, so we still have to work with that. We've, had a, we've incorporated a few tricks to try to shorten that, but that's still definitely a challenge. Um, also, apples are genetically very heterozygous, meaning that historically it's been difficult to predict traits in their offspring uh, from the parents' performance, uh, much as it is for, for some other crops and for animals. Fortunately, I think as we've been able to associate some of the important traits with DNA markers, you know, we're getting a little bit of that uncertainty out of the apple breeding process now. But those would be two of the, the major uh, challenges that we face. So when you're trying to breed a new variety and let's say take traits from several different apples, what, how long does it usually take to get to actually, let's say, the marketplace? Yeah, well, from when we make the cross, um, uh, if we start that at, say, year one, it's probably going to be about 15 to 20 years until we have trees going to growers. And then, of course, those growers have to uh, grow their trees up to a size where they produce a, fair, a, a reasonable amount of fruit that they can actually go to market with. And so it's probably going to be on the order of 20 to 25 years from when we make a cross until uh, the fruit is on a shelf, let's say, at a, at a supermarket. So when you have one that hits like the honey crisp, it really is a big deal. <laughs> it, yeah, it doesn't happen too often, and it takes a long time. Yeah. <laughs> So let's talk about uh, honey crisp apples. I know that uh, as a focus of your research, it's it's actually one of my favorites of, as well. Uh, you've called it a game changer. Why? Um, well, it, when it came out first, we introduced it in 1990s, um, and as it's risen in popularity now to become the number three apple in the United States, uh, it was really a game changer in terms of consumer satisfaction, I think, and consumer delight. Um, it had that crisp, it has that crisp, juicy texture that, you know, you get juice almost running down your chin. And that, especially back in the 90s and 2000s, was a really new experience for consumers. They really liked it. And they liked hearing that big explosive crunch when they bit into it. Um, so that was, you know, a big innovation. And now, as we go to try to introduce new apples, it's really the bar, it sets the bar for what we need to have as far as especially texture. Um, so that's, that's been um, really important. I think the other thing is the consumer really appreciated having a better product and uh, was willing to pay more. And so we also, we still see the price of Honeycrisp and some of the other new varieties uh, quite a bit higher than some of the, I'll, I'll call them legacy varieties, that were really the predominant varieties of the uh, late 20th century or mid 20th century. Um, so those are some of the ways that it's been a game changer for us and for other breeders too. And as you mentioned, Honeycrisp was, was introduced in the early 90s. And, and that was a time, I think, when you mentioned like the, the legacy apples were there just wasn't as much of a demand for it, and there's a lot of supply. So it seemed like the Honeycrisp really rejuvenated the market, and maybe even do you think it created kind of this this niche uh, this niche market for apple varieties? Yeah, I think it helped establish that you know in consumers' minds that it was worth trying new varieties, you know, that they maybe haven't seen before, and uh, well, if they like them, hopefully they buy them again, um, and so. That started, but prior to that, the consumer, especially at retail supermarkets, was not offered a lot of, of, uh, of variety in what was available, um, you know, through the mid 20th century, like back when I was growing up in the 1960s, 70s, um, you know, there's Red Delicious, Golden Delicious, Macintosh, that was pretty much what was available um, when my parents went to the supermarket then. And 
starting, I'd say, in about the 1990s, consumers began to just in general get more interested in their food and uh, the variety of food available, um, how it was produced. And so I think that's kind of that consumer interest also started, um, you know, an interest in, okay, you see a new variety of apple, well, maybe let's try that and see if we like it. And so I think Honeycrisp came along at a good time then when consumer curiosity was up a bit. And I don't think I asked this, uh, what, what, what is Honeycrisp across of? Are there a certain like popular varieties that you crossed it with? The two parents of Honeycrisp are not well known at all. <laughs> One is Keepsake, which is a uh, old variety from our program. It was introduced in the 1970s and uh, really never even caught on much regionally. And then the other parent is one that was never named. It simply had a number called Minnesota 1627. It was never introduced. Um, so those two were crossed back in 1960. If we go further back, yes, there are some uh, names that people might recognize. Certainly Golden Delicious is in there, um, Northern Spy, Wealthy, uh, and a few others too. Um, so it, it does trace some of its heritage back to some better known apples uh, of the of the 19th and early 20th centuries, yeah. And so what, what does the uh, the popularity of Honeycrisp, what does that mean for breeders uh, in the future? And even right now, how does that change how they're, what they're looking for for traits? Yeah, I think it means that, you know, pretty much most of the future apples will have to have that degree of crispness and juiciness that consumers uh, are seeing. Uh, uh, I think Honeycrisp will be around for many decades itself as a variety you know, for us to, for us to consume and enjoy. Um, but the biggest legacy it's probably going to have and, and probably going into the next century even will be its genetics. And because most breeders are using it to some extent in their breeding programs uh, around the world, not just here in the U.S. And we're seeing a number of new varieties that are Honeycrisp children already coming to market. We've, we've introduced uh, uh, three or four of them now. Uh, but others are as well. And uh, s those new varieties that'll be Honeycrisp children, probably eventually Honeycrisp grandchildren, will probably be around you know, for the next hundred years um, as apple varieties uh, th that are in the marketplace. So I think you know, its, it's big legacy, will pro even after it maybe disappears as a, as a top apple, uh, will be its, its genetics in other top apples. Okay, so let's let's talk about. You mentioned uh, that Honeycrisp was a game changer. What do you see as the next apple variety that's going to be the next game changer? The, the next big variety look look and taste like. Yeah, well, the next big variety is starting to hit the market already, and just based on the trees planted, it's probably going to be in the top five here by the end of this decade. And that's one that consumers will see as Cosmic Crisp. Um, and this is a, uh, a, a child of Honeycrisp. It was bred at Washington State University, and it's become widely planted in Washington over the last five years. So all these young trees that growers there have planted in the last five years will, will start reaching maturity here um, through the course of the 2020s, and I expect that'll be the next big one that we'll see in the, in our U.S. market. We're already starting to see it show up on on some supermarket shelves. And so, do you see a kind of? I guess it's no longer these niche apples. It's really just that the consumer trends have changed their taste that they want. They don't want to. You know, I know legacy apples are always popular mainly because of abundance, but. They're really looking for those other traits, like you said, the crispness, the sweetness, things like that. And so really that's going to kind of define what the future market looks like. Yeah, um, I think, you know, as long as we offer them interesting new apples, and that's going to be probably combining that uh, good, crisp, juicy texture with some interesting flavors, too. Uh, and, and, and also delivering it in very good condition after cold storage. Uh, will be, will, those will be the keys. Uh, you know, consumers, uh, I, I would say, generally like a crisp, juicy apple. There's not too many that like a soft, mushy apple. 
So that's, that's really you know, a given almost that we have to have that. And then there's a lot of different flavors and, and consumers like a lot of different flavors. So hopefully we can offer them some different ones. But those will be, yeah, those will be really important. Um, and then growers' ability to produce it at a price, certainly, that makes them money in the long run. That'll be important as well. Let's talk a little bit about your research. So what were some of the highlights of your research, you know, some of uh, your major accomplishments? Probably some of the most satisfying research the last, I guess, 15 to 20 years has been my involvement with, uh, with colleagues around the country in some of our efforts to uh, develop these DNA markers that are associated with important traits that we use in breeding. This kind of technology was something that when I was a graduate student back in the uh, 70s, you know, something we learned about was hypothetical. But to be able during my career to actually be a part of making it happen, that was just really cool. So over the course of, of um, the last uh, 15 years or so, and working especially through a uh, USDA Specialty Crops Research Initiative project called Rosebreed, uh, which worked on rosaceous crops of, of various sorts, mostly fruit crops. But um, we were able with a team from really around the country of university, mainly university and USDA uh, ARS researchers to get the technology and then do the studies that were needed to associate various traits with some of the DNR mar DNA markers. And so that's, that's been really a lot of fun to see plant, bring those advances into plant breeding. Now, the other project that we've started working on in the last, I'd say, six years or so has been what we call the Global Apple Pedigree Project. And that was really started by a former, uh, re a former graduate student and postdoctoral researcher in our group, uh, Dr. Nick Howard, who is now an apple breeder in the Netherlands. And Nick uh, has gradually been accumulating DNA data from over 9,000 apple varieties from around the world and is building kind of a, a great big global genealogy or pedigree of all these varieties. And that's going to allow us to be a lot more informed about what's in our apple germplasm or genetics collections, both in the USDA system and also uh, in collections around the world. It's going to allow breeders to have a greater level of predictability about what traits might be transmitted by an apple variety as a parent because they'll be able to uh, look at its, uh, how it's related to some of the other parents that also transmit a trait. And so that's kind of going to be the fun thing. We've got uh, uh, hopefully we'll we'll get some more get some publications out on that get a lot more information out on that in about the next two years or so we've already published some things on it uh, so far and lots of interesting relationships among apples apple varieties that we know. Okay, and the, that was uh, one of my future questions coming up was about this the global apple pedigree project. So tell me a little bit more about the goals. What what does the group hope to accomplish? Yeah, well, what we're trying to do is basically much like some of the human genealogy uh, websites that you can you can go to and you submit your you can submit your DNA and kind of see maybe what how you're related to maybe various individuals or uh, even groups of people. Um, it's kind of building that for apples, and of course, apples is a much simpler thing than humans. Uh, there aren't nearly as many of them, but the good thing about them is a lot of the old varieties going back. Uh, 800 years and even more are still in existence, especially over in Europe. And so we've been able to get DNA from contemporary varieties, but then also some of these old varieties that are still in, uh, in germplasm collections around the world. And uh, by we've developed some techniques to be able to determine the relationships, whether they're parents and offspring or grandparents and we can start building a whole genealogy of these varieties. And it turns out a lot of them are quite related, um, at least somewhat related, with connected pedigrees and uh, shared ancestors. 
And so the goals of that, uh, one thing is when we get the DNA fingerprints, we can actually confirm uh, whether they are what they say they are, kind of, and, and uh, confirm also whether two varieties that maybe have the same name but are in different collections around the world can, are also indeed the same, or whether they're in different collections and have different names but they're actually the same, then we can kind of solve that confusion too. So part of it is, is um, uh, providing some information that will allow germplasm curators to uh, manage their collections better. The other part is, the other, another big goal is to allow breeders to have more knowledge when they want to use a variety about what, it's, what it may be transmitting to its offspring. Uh, for example, if we know that we've used variety A uh, already, um, or they can, they've read about that, that somebody has used variety A and uh, for transmitting a disease resistance to its offspring, and they've got variety B, which they now know is related very closely to variety A, they can uh, have much more confidence that it will transmit that same trait to its offspring. So that's another, that's another one. Um, and then probably the third one is just apples are, are kind of iconic in not only in American culture. You know, we've got Johnny Appleseed uh, stories and, and uh, a lot of stories involving apples, but they're, they're iconic in a lot of cultures. And so people are, are curious. Apple varieties in a lot of cases have been around a long time. And so people are very curious sometimes about how they're related. And so this will help, uh, I think, satisfy uh, some curiosity of people about, about this crop and about the food they eat when they eat their apples. Yeah, I'm sure people are probably a, a little surprised that a lot of the, the, the apples today still have traits from the very first wild apples because a lot of those wild apples had a lot of disease resistance and other resistance traits that, you know, still apply today. Yes, that's right. Um, the domesticated apple that we have uh, actually originated with wild apples in Central Asia, what is now kind of southeastern, eastern Kazakhstan, um, and, and some adjacent areas of other countries. And those apples grew in forests there in the mountains and were carried by probably by traders along the Silk Road, what's sometimes called the Silk Road, the trade routes between China and, and Europe. And uh, went, went into Europe. Along the way, they picked up some genes uh, in the Caucasus region from a, another wild species that was there. And then also in Europe from the wild crab apple of Europe. And, and eventually those apples made their way to North America and other, uh, other parts that Europeans explored. But uh, it's a, yeah, it's a very interesting story. And we can now see those, those signatures as we have the DNA evidence, we can kind of see what, what part came from the Asian species, what part came from the European species, uh, maybe where we brought in some other species too through breeding. Okay, and let, let's kind of uh, move towards today. And you know, one of the biggest issues in all of agriculture is climate change. How is climate change affecting trait selection and breeding techniques with apples? talk about apple production and climate change first. Some of the pressures we're seeing on apple producers related to climate change are certainly, you know, higher temperatures in general, but especially higher night temperatures. And this is critical because in the late summer and autumn when apples ripen, usually to get good color and good flavor, they need cool night temperatures. And so what we're seeing is that we're, with climate change, we're getting warmer night temperatures uh, later into the season. And so apples are having to ripen their fruit under warmer conditions. So one of the things uh, as breeders we're selecting for is the ability to uh, get good flavor, good color, good texture as our nighttime temperatures are maybe five or maybe even 10 degrees higher than they used to be when the apples are ripening. Uh, so that's a big one. The other, another one we're seeing is less predictable spring times. We see big warm ups followed by some frost events. And we've certainly always had this, but it seems to be accentuated now. 
So getting a later or delayed bloom in the spring is becoming a more important trait as well. And then we are seeing uh, uh, more ra massive rainfall events sometimes. In that, and this, and as well, along with the warmer temperatures, this is kind of allowing diseases to move a little further north than they used to be. So maybe diseases that we saw, like in the mid Atlantic states, uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago, are now starting it to move into southern New York and uh, Ohio, Michigan, some of the southern Midwest states. And so uh, we're starting to see these changes, so there'll be a need for for resistance to different diseases too. So those are some of the challenges that our producers are facing and in turn they become traits that we as breeders have to start thinking about and selecting for. So it sounds like you really need or that breeders really need or to breed almost an adaptable or flexible apple, one that can handle because especially with the weather patterns, the droughts, um, the, the flooding, things like that, a lot of rainfall, and then just the unpredictability of weather patterns. Is it possible to, to breed an apple that can kind of adapt to a different climate or a changing climate? Well, we sure hope so. Um, some things, some of these potential changes or actual changes that are happening, you know, we've got other mitigation methods. So, uh, you know, we do have irrigation available uh, in most you know, for most apple growing regions. And so that can help with some of the unpredictability as far as drought, especially. Um, the temperature is probably one that's a little harder to mitigate. We can put shade cloth over orchards and that's being done um, to, to lower the temperature and also to prevent sunburn. I didn't mention sunburn, but that's another problem we're seeing more as we get higher daytime temperatures. Uh, and that causes the, the skin on the fruit to be damaged and then it doesn't store very well. Uh, but so that's a little harder to, to manage the temperature. And that's probably where we need to focus most of our efforts. And then of course, these diseases that come along uh, that, that might be new to a region. Um, we may or may not have other effective means of control. There might be uh, either organic or non-organic chemical means of control but uh, it's something we might have to worry about genetic resistance as well. Did that answer your question? <laughs> yes, it does, yes. And then, okay. and so uh, moving into that, what does the future of apple breeding look like? Um, I, I think some of the, well, the, the biggest change we are in the midst of right now is the incorporation of, of DNA information into our breeding. And we're gonna see, you know, we probably, we're not as big a crop, we don't have the resources that some of the other big crops do or that we've had in animal breeding. But if we look at where animal breeding has gone with DNA information and some of the, the uh, bigger field crops, uh, uh, maize, uh, soybean, cotton, for example, um, we'll be heading there over the next decade as we uh, have more information on the association of DNA markers with traits. And that'll make our breeding more predictable, should make it slightly faster. Right now, we like to see uh, how a, a new selection performs before we use it as a parent. But if we've got predictive DNA information that says, yes, it should perform well for trait A, maybe not as well for trait B, we can, we can match it up uh, as soon as it flowers with another parent and probably save several years in the breeding cycle that way. So that'll be a big change uh, that's, that's already underway. Another one we will probably see eventually is gene editing. Uh, we're seeing this starting in other crops right now and uh, in certain countries where gene edited products are, are not regulated like the United States. Uh, we're probably gonna see that happening Apples tend to be a technically difficult crop to do gene editing with because some of the in vitro techniques don't work as well for woody trees as they do for uh, herbaceous annual crops. And so that's right now definitely a, a big technical difficulty, as well as not having a lot of gene trait targets. 
that we can employ. But, but those will be certainly uh, some of the big changes in the technology. Okay. Well, that's the, all the questions I had. Uh, thank you, Dr. Luby, for joining us today for Under the Microscope. This has been a terrific interview. And I want to, again, congratulate you on receiving the 2023 B.Y. Morrison Memorial Lecture Award. Thank you. It's quite an honor to uh, receive the lectureship.